Um, if you miss anything or you would like to share the recording with uh, people that you know who will be interested, you're more than welcome to do that. It will be available on our YouTube channel uh, by the end of the week. So that'll be available for you as well. So with that in mind, if you would like to turn off your own personal video, you're more than welcome to do that. It does not affect your viewing of Stephen and his screen and your um, ability to watch the presentation. So you're welcome to do that to protect your own privacy. Okay, how are we going? Okay, it looks like everybody's in. So um, welcome once again, and I'm going to hand over to Tully Nates. Good evening, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon uh, from Johannesburg. Thank you very much, Catherine, for uh, hosting us so beautifully. My name is Tali Nates. I'm the director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And it is wonderful to welcome all the new friends uh, from all around the world. We, we have people from Turkey, Austria, Germany, Australia, uh, US, uh, of course, uh, from uh, um, uh, UK, Israel, and all parts of South Africa, and many, many more. A special welcome to Pinchas uh, Guta and his wife, Dorothy. Special welcome to other Holocaust survivors. Uh, Vanda Aldinsky is with us as well. And, uh, Special welcome to many colleagues from the USC Shoah Foundation, as well as from uh, uh, many other museums around the world and uh, universities around the world. Uh, and uh, it is really wonderful to see so many friends here with us. Also special welcome to our sister centers in South Africa, uh, the, the uh, staff and uh, volunteers at the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center, Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center, and Stephen, of course, your very, very old friend, Myra Osren. So uh, wonderful to, to have everyone here with us. Tomorrow is the 16th of June, and in South Africa, it is Youth Day. Uh, it is a time uh, to reflect on the past and to learn lessons for the present and the future. Of course, at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, as a center of memory, of education, of dialogue, and of lessons for humanity, we encourage youth leadership, and uh, we are, all of us, are empowered by the voices of our youth and the critical thinking uh, that they uh, show when we interact with them. Uh, and we need it more than ever for our world today. Uh, of course, the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, like its sister centers in South Africa, in Cape Town and Durban, honors the memory of the victims of the Holocaust and of genocide in the 20th century and teaches about the consequences of prejudice and hate speech so as to prevent the recurrence of mass atrocities and genocide in all their forms. So we learn so much from our survivors all the time. And uh, we, of course, look forward to learn from our friends and colleagues at the USC Shah Foundation, and specifically from uh, our very good friend, Stephen Smith, about uh, how new technologies and new ways um, in technologies enabling survivors to tell their stories in new ways. Um, it is wonderful to welcome Stephen to the webinar tonight. And let me uh, introduce Stephen officially to you, uh, to you all. Dr. Stephen D. Smith is the Finchi Viterbi Executive Director of USC Shoah Foundation and holds the UNESCO Chair on Genocide Education. Smith founded the UK Holocaust Center in Nottinghamshire, England, and uh, co-founded the Aegis Trust for the Prevention of Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide, um, which we work very closely with uh, for many years. Smith has served as a producer on a number of film and new media projects, including Dimensions in Testimony and the VR project, The Last Goodbye. 
In recognition of his work, Smith has become a member of the Order of the British Empire and received the Interfaith Gold Medallion. He also holds two honorary doctorates and lectures widely on issues relating to the history and collective response to the Holocaust, genocide, and crimes against humanity. Stephen was involved in the founding of the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center and is a patron of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation with its three centers in South Africa. I'm eternally grateful for his friendship and uh, his advice over the years while creating the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Uh, could not have done it without your sound advice through the years. So we look very much forward to learn from you. The floor is yours, Stephen. Ali, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me uh, today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for all your work at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, which uh, all of us at the USC Show Foundation admire immensely. And in fact, the work of the entire uh, foundation across South Africa. Uh, just a point of clarification, Myra Osman is not my very, very old friend. She's a very long standing friend. Uh, Myra, it's wonderful to have you on. Uh, what a formidable group of people as I look through the participants. Uh, Myra from Cape Town, also see Mary Kloop from uh, Durban. Uh, your three centers together are a real powerhouse in South Africa. I also noticed some other people on as well. Um, I see that Susan Abrahams and um, Kelly Shaney are on from Illinois Holocaust Memorial uh, Holocaust Museum and Education Center. Uh, wonderful to have you on and thank you for your partnership in Dimensions and Testimony, Susan and Kelly, uh, because your museum has been an amazing partner in making sure we can get these new technologies in front of the public where exactly where they belong. I would also like to call out as well and, and welcome to our uh, group today, um, Andrew Viterbi, uh, who, who has the name Viterbi, this is in my title, the Fincy Viterbi uh, Executive Director Chair and is a lifetime member of the, uh, the board at the Show Foundation and also a member of our Executive Committee, Trudy Goddesman. Thank you both for being on today. Um, I'd also like to say uh, hi to Paul de Bevec, who is uh, a long-term partner of the Show Foundation and is at Google Virtual Reality, where he's a senior scientist and uh, it's a little trepidatious uh, presenting this in front of Paul, who is one of the creators of immersive technologies and thanks for joining Paul today. Finally, a little bit later in the, in the session, we're going to get to speak to uh, Pinkas Gutter, uh, who's been on quite a journey um, starting in Cape Town uh, in 1998, I believe it was, when uh, Myra Osrin sent me to go and interview Pinchas for the new museum in Cape Town that was being developed. Um, and we met that day, 1998, and have been lifelong journeymen ever since, including into the world of immersive technologies. So the title, Holocaust XR, which 42% of you don't even know what it means, but were still willing to join this. Congratulations, thank you for your curiosity. That is terrific. So I'm glad that some of you Googled it um, because we all need to get used to this term. Um, XR, mixed realities. So what has that got to do with the Holocaust, you might say? Um, because we have, over the years, gone through a journey of discovery about Holocaust testimony, um, by which uh, we have now grown used to listening to Holocaust survivors and watching survivors uh, give their testimony in video. But we have, in the digital age, worked, uh, worked towards a new reality, which is that we no longer experience um, the, pe the way in which people tell their history in only one form of technology. So one of the things that we've been grappling with at the USC Shoah Foundation is, so how do we want to tell this story through the voices of those who experienced it in future? So we've had a, um, you know, some looking backwards actually to start with. It's an amazing story that um, I came across purely by accident um, while I was looking at a, a film reel from Bergen-Belsen in 1945. We've all seen clips from this film reel. You know, the terrible images of the bulldozer pushing the bodies and uh, the former SS carrying the corpses and putting them into the huge mass graves. They appear in documentaries on a very regular basis. But I'd never seen the full, full reel. Um, but I was looking for a particular um, 
uh, survivor who I thought might have been in that reel. So I watched all 19 minutes of it just in case she appeared in it. And lo and behold, somewhere in the middle of that reel, a young woman steps up to the microphone. Behind her is a mass grave containing somewhere in the region of 5,000 corpses. Um, and she's standing at a microphone and she, in 93 seconds, describes the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. And I realize I am looking at the very first audiovisual testimony of the Holocaust. April 21st, 1945, the war is not yet over. It's 93 seconds long. She said her name was Hella Goldstein. So I went to the Shoah Foundation's archive and those of you who have been familiar with the Shoah Foundation over the years know that you can search the entire archive. So I put her name in, Hella Goldstein, to see whether or not she had given a testimony later in her life to the Shoah Foundation. And uh, the name appeared, Hella Goldstein, as the former name of a lady called Helen Collin, who was interviewed by the Shoah Foundation in 1996 in Houston, Texas. So I called one of my colleagues at the Houston Holocaust Museum to know, say if they knew a Helen Collin, and they did, um, but they thought that she may have just gone into hospice care. They called back half an hour later. She had been into hospice to get some pain meds, but she was back in her apartment. And so a couple of days later, I was in Houston to talk to her about that day in 1945. And what I discovered was that that 21 year old who was standing by the mass grave knew precisely why she was giving her testimony that day. What was very interesting about it was she believed that she was going to die for giving her testimony because standing right in front of her when she was talking at those 93 seconds were her former captors, the SS. So I said to her, why did you do that if you thought you were going to die? And she said, because telling the story was more important than living or dying in that moment of time. Thus began the, the whole uh, process of taking testimony um, that we have you know, assumed really didn't take place until the 1990s in, in any volume. But in fact, Holocaust survivors were telling their stories all the way along. What was important about Helen Collins' testimony was, as far as she was concerned, it was talking to the camera was a new media project at that time. And in fact, when um, archivist David Boda turned up from the Illinois Institute of Technology a year later, carrying what looks like a big hunk of iron metal with a metal um, uh, ribbon that would record sound. It was a new media project when he interviewed over a hundred survivors, talking to them in audio, lugging this piece of equipment around, which we now just have built into our phones. It was an audio recording of their voices. Holocaust survivors have been using new media to tell their story since 1945 is the point I want to make. So there is nothing new about what I'm going to show you. The second thing is this. At the USC Shoah Foundation, we are interested in documenting the life histories of individuals as told by those individuals. But what I've learned through my own research and experience over the years is that the medium is part of the story itself. So if I sit in your living room and I interview you and I have no camera and I have a pencil and paper and I talk to you and I write down notes, what, I result, what the result of that interview will be different to the, if I put the audio recorder in front of you and I record every word that you say, which will be different again to if I put a video camera in the space. And in fact, when the video camera is introduced, the conversation changes because the video camera itself becomes part of the conversation. It's part of, it's part of the environment in which you speak. But then if, I t if we go outside and we talk about and we walk around with our video camera, we get a different uh, kind of conversation because now I can talk about the topography, the places, the, the things that I experienced in the places that I experienced them. If I sit inside a green screen with lots of cameras pointed at me and I answer questions, um, then I answer those questions in a different way again. If I'm told who the audience is, that now I'm going to be answering questions specifically for 10 to 12 year olds, I'm going to answer those questions differently than if I'm told that this is an audio visual history for uh, the purposes of documenting your story for the historical record, assuming that therefore um, it's adults or researchers that are going to look at that interview. So the medium and the method both change or alter or impact what is said 
and how it is said. Technology, therefore, impacts what we do with testimony. What I want to show you is some different methods that we've been working with um, and to, to explore together what it means to work with these mixed realities, that is, different types of technology, in order to tell the story. So if you excuse me one minute, I'm going to share screen and I'm going to um, just go to a little PowerPoint here. We'll, we'll dip in and out of this as the, as the time goes by. Um, so here we have Pinchas Gutter, who's on the call. Welcome, Pinchas and Dorothy from Toronto. We'll speak to you in a little while. Um, and what we're going to be addressing is how technology um, enables survivors to tell their stories in new ways. Now, I want to say, first of all, that at the UC Show Foundation, we never put technology first. What comes first is, what is the story we want to tell? What is the outcome that we want to get through that process of telling the story? And how might we use technology to enable us? Paul de Bevec, who is on, on, on the call today, will remember when we were talking about the development of dimensions and testimony, um, that we had a discussion very early on, which was, if we're going to be successful with this form of interactive media by which you can ask questions and get answers back, we shouldn't know the technology is there. In other words, it shouldn't be about the technology first. It should be about the conversation and the content. And then the technology should be so seamless and so sophisticated that you don't even realize what it's doing. And so we kept that as a principle of what we did. So before I get into the actual types of new testimony that we're taking, I'm just going to show here, if I can move my, there we go. Um, the face of the USC Shoah Foundation today. These five individuals, uh, Dario Gabay in the middle of that screen there, uh, former Zonda commando from Auschwitz-Birkenau, passed away just about six weeks ago here in Los Angeles. One of the last surviving members of the Zonda commando who could actually tell us what exactly happened in crematorium three at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Surrounded by four women, um, the oldest of which there, Mrs. Salibian, also now passed away, a, a survivor of the Armenian genocide, and the three ladies from Rwanda and from Guatemala and from Cambodia the face of genocide in the 20th century. Show Foundation has 55,000 testimonies, of which about 52,000 are of the Holocaust, mainly survivors of the Holocaust, but also uh, we have a range of uh, witnesses from the different groups, for example, uh, Roma and Sinti, or political prisoners um, that were incarcerated, as well as Righteous Among the Nations, 1,500 of those, a remarkable group of people, and uh, through to prosecutors and people that helped in the camps, uh, in the DP camps, and uh, maybe with war crimes investigations and so forth. So one of the big things that we use technology for um, is preservation. So why is that important at the very top of our uh, agenda here? Well, if we can't keep what we've got, then we can't pass it to future generations. We have got used to thinking in the digital age, well, I've digitized my content, therefore it's safe for all time. And just as a quick reminder for all of those of you who have got digital content from your families and your friends and your vacations and your bar mitzvahs and your weddings, digitization is not preservation. You stick it in the cloud and you hope and pray God that Google's going to be there or Apple's going to be there. Um, believe me, you need to think about how you preserve that because it's not the same as just sticking it on the cloud. At the Show Foundation, we take no risks over that. All of our testimonies are disaggregated from the cloud. We do use the cloud and we have our own private cloud, but we also have our testimonies offline so that they are digital and they are preserved. We check every testimony every three months, and if we lose so much as a single pixel off one of those digital media, we replace it and we restore it. Because we know that if we're going to pass this to the next generation, and they're going to pass it to the next generation, and the one after that, and the one after that, 200 years from now, we can't take any chances over losing our digital media. Every second is precious. And the medium in which we keep things is continually deteriorating. So we have to keep it fresh and pristine and checked, and we do that relentlessly. I'm going to show you a very quick video. I apologize about these videos because you're going to hear my voice in them, and usually these videos are not played with me anywhere near them. But anyway, here we go. It's just a little introduction to what preservation is all about. My PowerPoint works. Let's try that. Hmm. 
like that. You see them? Just ordinary people living ordinary lives. And that's the thing about genocide. It's not so extraordinary. It's created by ordinary people making extraordinarily bad choices about how they will treat other ordinary people just like them. It can happen anywhere. And yes, I did say anywhere. And so when all their stories were gathered up, we made a promise that we would keep their testimony in perpetuity, which, as it turns out, is a very long time. Time heals and time steals. When the tape rots, the stories die. Digitization and the cloud, they don't solve any of that. So bit by bit, literally, we save and store and check and migrate and replenish every frame of every minute of every hour of video with best-in-class preservation. Robots do the work day in and day out, year in and year out. Computer science at the service of humanity. All 116,000 hours of testimony, which if we sat to watch it right here, right now, would take through January 2030 to watch, and that's if we don't take a break. We protect every frame, because the story really matters. We have another race against time to ensure the stories we collect today are relevant tomorrow. So um, the next thing I'd like to show you is um, how um, we a new method of taking testimony, which we call testimony on location. In fact, this began um, in 2016 uh, when Pinchas Gutter and I and a crew, uh, which included director Ari Pallet and Garbo Aurora, um, went to Maidanic with Pinchas. Um, some of you might know that, uh, in fact, in uh, 2000 and um, um, one, Pinkos and I went to uh, Maidanic for the first time to go and revisit the places where he had come from. Um, and um, it was a truly remarkable occasion for me to be standing at Maidanic um, in the place where he was separated from his twin sister, Sabina. And Pinkos told me that, you know, the likelihood of him going back to Poland was, um, you know, getting very much lower. And so we decided to go together for one final trip to Maidanic. Um, and we took with us um, a camera that would allow us to film Pinchas in the place where he had experienced uh, the Holocaust, but to capture that whole environment in 360. 360 is where you can see, you can stand inside a room and you can either put on virtual reality goggles or you can spin around using a screen and you can see the entire room that Pinchas was in. What that meant was, as a result of that, going through seven different types of rooms with Pinchas, we could then go and literally do the tour that he would do with teachers and with students, going through the barracks to the gas chamber, to the room with the shoes, to the mausoleum, um, and the places that he would visit and tell his story. That was put together in a film called The Last Goodbye, where Pinchas went for the last time to say goodbye to his family. So subsequently, what we've done is developed a method of taking testimony now called Testimony on Location, which was derived from that project. And you can see in this picture here on the right hand side, a camera with a little ball on the top of it. And also in the middle of there, uh, over here, the camera sitting in the front. Um, this gentleman over here is Aaron Bell. Aaron Bell is the youngest member of the Bielski Partisans. And there he's sitting in a forest near Novogrodek last September. Um, where we took him back to the location where he and the partisans had been in the forest and we filmed him giving his testimony in that location. What that means is now we can see and go to that forest and see Aaron telling his story in the forest as if we're in the forest ourselves because we can now see everything around about us. They call that virtual reality, which uh, of course Paul de Bevec has in his title. Um, but for most of us that don't have that, we experience that by perhaps going on to the Oculus store as one example of where we might go to find um, the different types of media where you can see um, everything around you and it's been filmed in that way or animated in that way. We decided not to treat this as filmmaking, but to treat it as testimony. 
So we go and Aaron can talk in that space for as long as he likes about that space. We don't put any restrictions on that. And you can also see the second camera there. That's picking up his image just as if he was giving his normal testimony on a flat um, screen in that space. Let me show you another short video um, of how we've been working together with March of the Living. As you know, March of the Living take thousands of young people, or did before the COVID crisis, to Poland each year and then to Israel. And when they're there in Poland, they visit multiple sites with Holocaust survivors who travel on the buses with them and tell them their stories. Of course, that's a wonderful and amazing experience they have right now, but that is not permanent. And there will come a time when it's just too much to schlep to Poland every year. Um, and there'll come a time when there is no one to do that. And so what we've been doing is working with the survivors that do go to Poland with the young people to film them in the locations, doing the very itinerary that they do currently with the young people on March of the Living so that in future, those young people can still hear them telling their stories in the locations. Let me show you a short film which shows that whole process. It's going to be a few minutes, this one, but hang fire. It's very interesting. I've been here three times. Each time it brings different memories. This place brings back some of the horrible memories that a person can experience. And it is also a place that we experience the life that we don't wish on anybody else. We certainly want to make sure in our life, whatever happened here, won't happen again to anyone. It's a cattle car, and there were 80 of us inside, squeezed together like sardines. Finally, it came in here. They were yelling women and children to the right, men to the left. I was holding on to my sister and my little brother, Tuli, my sister, Goldie, and they were just pulled away from me, and that was the last time I've seen them. Not too far from here, and I could see the flames from our barracks, the screams throwing in children into the fire pits here. There were between 700,000 and 900,000 people murdered here. Among them, my mother. This camp, to me, is the most moving place because there's nothing except the stones. I'm here where I was born. Hard to imagine how it was gonna stay with me till the rest of my life. I go with the young people and I told them my story. Can anyone imagine what this place was like 75 years ago? I don't think so. How does one survive? You just kept thinking you want to live another second. I'm happy to be alive and be in nature. Can you imagine? Birds are singing here. We have to be able to tell the story for future generations so that they can have an idea as to what happened in this place. That's how we build our future.
Um, excuse my little red line on here, folks. Um, while I'm in screen share, I can't do much about it, but I will do later. Um, so here we have um, the idea is that we take those videos that we film on location that you just saw, and then we make them available to future generations through something called the USC Show Foundation's iWalk. And iWalk is an app that allows you to go to a place and experience testimony in that place as given by the survivor at that place. So let me give you an example here. Um, as we look on this screen, you'll see that um, we can go to a particular place. You've got the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Romania. I click on that and just say it's going to be Poland. Um, and I'm in that location. And now what I've got is a walk. It's actually starting at the, uh, the, the museum, at the, um, uh, the Poland Museum in Warsaw. And it works its way through, as you can see, see different parts of the um, um, experience there. As I go across, then what happens is I go to a particular place, I find that um, I've got um, testimony, photos, documents, information about that place um, that I can view in that place. What's wonderful about this though, in addition to that, is that um, when I'm in my classroom, maybe I'm never gonna go to Poland. What I can also do then is experience this on a desktop in the classroom, and I can do that very walking tour and visit those places in 360 degrees and see what it's like to be at those places. I could look at them on my flat screen in my, in my um, classroom, or I could put on virtual reality goggles and I could experience them as if I'm standing in that location in Poland. And so without actually flying to Warsaw, I can visit these eight sites of this particular walk um, and learn about it. What's also interesting is these are in the local languages too. So every I walk that we do is in Czech and English, Hungarian and English, Polish and English, Romanian and English, because of course, for the students that are living in those towns right across Europe, um, they don't have to fly anywhere if they're uh, at school in Warsaw to go and experience uh, what we see in, in that I walk there. Um, what I also have here, I'm just gonna play this for you. This is what, hap what I can see on my phone now with Mac on July 8, 1944, in the middle of the night, the loudspeakers went on, powerful loudspeakers, and uh, it said, Achtung, Achtung, all inmates from barracks so and so have to get out of their bunks naked and go to this particular barrack for selection. So I'm just viewing that on my phone, as you can see, in 360. What it means is that students either can go to Auschwitz and hear Max speaking about the place that they're at when they are doing their tour, or of course they can also see that at home or in their classrooms. And so now it's possible to go to these places with the survivors themselves. Starling. So what do we do with this technology? Well, what you see here is a camera. Um, somebody was asking it, I forget who it was, a few moments ago about India. And thank you for asking that question. Uh, let me just see who asked that. Uh, Mehak Burza, thank you for asking uh, Mehak about India. You're absolutely right to say that there are so many stories to tell around the world, and of course, including in South Africa, where we're hosting uh, this evening, um, stories about atrocity and violence that need to be documented for the history of our world. This particular project you're seeing on the screen here, um, you can see this lady being interviewed in North Kurdistan, fled from uh, northern Syria um, after the um, events of October last year when the President of the United States and the President of Turkey did a deal about a so-called safe zone in northern Syria, and this was one of the victims of that. What you see there is two cameras. Um, on the right hand side, you see the regular camera that's taking her interview as we would do for a life history. And on the left hand side, that phone device actually is a HTC phone that has something on it called Starling. Starling is a software that the Shoah Foundation has developed in order to be able to take testimony that will be placed on something called blockchain. 
everybody's been hearing about cryptocurrencies and, and how they work. They work on something called blockchain. Turns out that blockchain is also very handy for preserving testimony. We can, play, we can take this testimony on this phone and encode it in such a way that it cannot be changed. It can be streamed onto blockchain and preserved there forever, for long as there is a internet. What that means is that in the field, you can now use mobile devices to collect testimony and place it directly into a preservation repository. We're developing Starlink for another reason. Most of us have been very careful about and are concerned about the issue of deep fakes. The fact that in dig with digital media, you can take the story of anybody and transform it into the story of anything, more or less, by placing words literally into the mouths of the interviewee. You can't with Starling. You can't change it. You can't fake it. You can't manipulate it. Well, at least if you do, we're going to know because it's encoded in such a way that if you try and change the file, the file will tell us that it's being changed. That's why this isn't actually called the USC Shower Foundation Preservation Project on blockchain and why we've called it Starling because we intend to make this available worldwide for news agencies and archives and history repositories to be able to use and we're going to open source it so that anybody can use it to make sure that the things that we see streamed on our um, news channels and on our, in our archives is the original. Don't get me wrong. You can lie to the camera the very first time and all you'll do is have, of course, the original lie, but at least we'll know it's the original file. The important thing is this, if somebody is telling truth and they are, have informa information about the past, we will know it's the original file. And we're going to encode the entire USC Show Foundation's archive with Starling at some point and place the entire thing on blockchain so that we have a secondary repository, which is um, not changeable. Finally, I want to bring us to Dimensions and Testimony. Uh, many of you have been hearing about this. I mentioned at the beginning that we partnered with the Illinois Holocaust Memor uh, Museum and Education Center in Illinois, um, where testimonies like the one that we're seeing in front of us of Eva Schloss and actually now 24 different survivors is available uh, for people to engage with. The idea came about almost 10 years ago when uh, Heather Smith, who is now my wife and was not then, that's a whole other story, uh, came to me and said, you know, I think we need to be able to capture the testimonies of survivors so that the conversations that they're having in our museums and our classrooms can be preserved. Uh, we sat together with the Institute of Creative Technology and Paul DeBevec, who's on the call, um, to figure out how do we do that? How do we capture these um, individuals in such a way that we can, they can be lifelike and they can be three-dimensional and that they can have the presence in our classrooms and in our museums in the future. And then we asked them a thousand questions and more about their lives. Um, and those questions then get put into a database that we can then query using voice recognition. I'm just going to uh, play your final little video here that explains it and pardon me again, you're gonna see me all over again. This is about dimensions and testimony. The Holocaust is an undeniable and horrific chapter in human history in which six million Jews and countless millions perished in genocide and crimes against humanity during the Second World War. Dimensions and Testimony is a new format of interview by which you can ask your questions of a Holocaust survivor who has videotaped answers to many questions so that the questions that you have will be answered directly, in person, life-size, and 3D. What was life like before the war? I had a very happy childhood. I loved to be together with my family. We understand very well the power of conversation between Holocaust survivors and the younger generation. We've seen it in our schools, we've seen it in our universities. That conversation, that moment of dialogue where I ask my question and I get it answered is just a, a, it's magic in the room when that happens. And we wanted to try and find a way to preserve that as best possible. What's wonderful about conversing with these Holocaust survivors in this interactive form is that it's, it's about you, it's about what you want to know. Conversation allows you to, to learn in a way that most suits your interest, and that's where the deepest learning takes place. Do you feel hope for the future? I always feel hopeful. 
If I wasn't hopeful, I wouldn't be talking to you or anybody else about my experience. I'm very happy that I was able to survive. And here I am, I was one of the lucky the questions that students have is what's driving the learning experience and so we know that this is important because we're going to enable them to be able to learn through their own curiosity. We are almost out of time to have deep conversations with Holocaust survivors. If we don't have these conversations now they will never take place. Oh, there you are. Hi, Pinchas. Hi. Um, <laughs> by the way, I have to leave at uh, just before 2.15 because I have a Jerusalem. I'm speaking to Holocaust educators and guides uh, from JR. So I won't be, I have to leave before 2.15. So I think uh, Stephen's uh, screen froze, but he will join us in a minute. But I think for everyone, uh, the over 170 people with us to see you in person after they saw you on the screen uh, is a treat. I just uh, will wait for, for Stephen to join us because he wanted to bring you in now so, uh, and to ask you some questions. Okay. <laughs> I uh, put on my audio, so... Okay, so, so maybe he's, uh, as he's trying, because he has to reboot his computer, he crashed, so he's rebooting. Um, I will start with you, Pinchas, to maybe to, to ask you, uh, how, you know, how was it uh, when, when Stephen came to you for the first time and said to you this absolutely crazy idea, you know, you are going to be here forever and ever? Well, it was it was a crazy idea, and not only me, but the engineers at the at the University of Southern California, they didn't believe it, and uh, so we decided to do a kind of uh, one day trip where I went to Los Angeles, and uh, they took me to a small room. They said it would be impossible for a Holocaust survivor to answer all these questions, and uh, they put a few cameras. And uh, they said they, uh, they'll give it an hour and see what happens. In the meantime, after they started asking me questions and sitting there, uh, we spent the whole morning, then we had lunch, and all the engineers were so uh, impressed with the, the fact that Holocaust survivors could answer question impromptu without any uh, uh, kind of um, uh, beginning or uh, uh, pre preparation that they had lunch and then they stayed in the afternoon and they said they could stay some more and they started working on the possibility of, uh, of uh, developing the software to be able to start this, uh, this whole scene and, uh, and Dimensions and Testimony were born in that little room uh, where I went and I started uh, my first interview with them with all these cameras and uh, all those questions and uh, they gave me a book and they told me to put my hand this way and my hand that way and uh, and and um, and for me it was very important because i am a great believer in education and i've been 17 times back to poland with march of remembrance and hope i've been 
lecturing at the universities and as you know all over the world and i feel that this te life testimony interaction between a so holocaust survivor any holocaust survivor whether it's rwanda or uh, cambodia or anywhere is so important for the to educate people and to stop them from doing these things that is the main purpose educate people what can happen show them the reality of it and then you know maybe the world can do things in a better way absolutely and we need that now more than ever lauren carter wants to ask you pinchas uh, what has been the value in sharing your testimony in so many different formats you know because you still speak to people you go on journeys you you did testimonies and now you did that what do you think is the value of that well the value is i mean you, you take for example virtual reality you know the film that was made uh, the last one the last goodbye well it shows you can put on the earphones and your goggles and you walk with me in my dunnet and i think uh, the fact that you can walk with me and you can actually see me in situ in the place where i was and listen to the story i think it is so important that the effect it has on a on a person is quite different than just seeing it on a flat screen and talking because i think it it makes an impression uh, the interaction whether it is you know the best of course is when you are there talking in front of the people you themselves or, or or whether they dimension to test or virtual reality the effect it has on them is actually life it, it stays there for life and the, the the proof in the in the pudding is that all the uh, all the people that i have many many of them i get reports from them and uh, they sent me letters and they sent me emails uh, which shows that they have never ever been able to forget this and they've never been able to they, they, they do something about it that that's even more important than anything else i mean some of them went to rwanda to to help that came with me on the march remembrance and all some of the women some of them went to haiti back that came because i have been you know with people from all over the world and they do something about it and i think that's very important Absolutely. Hi, Charlie. I'm, I'm back, Charlie. Thank, thanks yeah, for yeah. stepping in there. The, 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 the lesson here very clearly is that the one wonderful thing about technology is that it sometimes works and uh, sometimes doesn't. Um, because I, did, I added an additional question. I see that somebody's asking you about technology and whether it scares you and whether or not it's misuses. Because I, I think we, well, one of the reasons I talked a little about preservation was to say how, you know, much time and attention we pay to making sure it can't get misused do, do you worry about its misuses well i always worry about misuse especially with you know with the internet that can do any that people can hack in and do all kinds of things it does but i think um, satisfied with the way it is husbanded by the shaw foundation that i am really not worried that it's going to be if it's used by the Shaw Foundation and they and they guard it, especially with the latest uh, information that you gave us. I am very very happy that that the importance of it. Anyway, the way I put it, the importance of this digital and all these other virtual reality or new dimensions is so important that the the little effect that it might affect that it might be misused is not a concern to me. Uh, because there's a question here from, I think it's from Jean, uh, talking about Rwanda and the fact, just, just talk to us for a moment or two about when you see genocide happening and violent conflict. Uh, Jean's mentioning about uh, the Congo here and the fact that it's been bleeding for years. Um, how does that make you feel and what do you want us to do about that? Well, you know, it makes me feel terrible. When I watch, when I watch the Rohingya being chased out of uh, Miramar or Burma, and uh, when I see, see these scenes on the on the uh, uh, on the television, 
it breaks my heart because it just reminds me of what happened to us and these are human beings and human beings are human beings it doesn't matter whether what, what, what creed what religion what color they they all people that need to be you know safe and it breaks my heart and i think what is important for the Shoah foundation is to bring this to the world and the way they present it at least that's the way i feel about it is that they present it in such a way that it's, there's always a message of please do something about it i mean you took me to the united nations and i spoke to all these ambassadors and everything else and i told them i said you high mighty individuals ambassadors and prime ministers i mean you can do something about it and that's what the Shaw foundation is doing and i think that is the most important thing thank you i'm just going to answer one or two other questions here Pinchas, that are coming in about technology itself and testimony um i think that um the point about that's being made about um the fact that you start with goggles and headphones but there are ideas about deeper immersion i think it's very interesting um one thing that we're not we are trying we're not trying to do um is to create a sort of immortality um human beings have a lifespan and we live our life and we make our choices and we you know we we do what we can with the opportunity we have and then at some point that comes to an end and there is this sort of um i think drive for immortality there is also a real interest um in the technical world these days in avatars and bots and those those things that um we recreate the human being with um, in order to represent ourselves and we're not trying to do that in fact we go to great lengths to make sure that um you cannot put the words into the mouth of Pinchas Guter um in fact what he said and what he did and what the other holocaust survivors have bequeathed to us is the full entire total of their archive so um we're not trying to do either of those things however what we do want to do is collect our data in such a way that to the point that one of the um our attendees said today is there are other ways of going deeper in, immer in immersion we are collecting much more data than we need at this time so for example when pinchas sat um, at the institute of creative technologies at uh, usc he was surrounded by over 50 cameras that were collecting angles from all different sides of him and at the moment we're only using one of them but we know that in due course as projectors and as um screens catch up and as technology catches up we'll be able to use that content in future to get an even more immersive experience with technologies that we don't even know right now exist another example is uh you saw the um the picture there of max eisen um at auschwitz and he was talking standing by the fence well we took that video um in that place so you can see him standing there and you can look at it in 360 degrees but also we have what we call a depth map on that camera which means that we can cut max away from that background and just place him in the space now it's difficult to imagine so imagine you're at auschwitz and you're looking at the barracks in front of you now what you can do is use your phone or your device and then play the testimony and max will appear in the space in front of you now we aren't actually using that augmented reality method right now in iwalks but what we've done in order to be able to project forward to say when we're ready for this and when it's the right thing to do we will then introduce this technology what we're doing is collecting that data now for future use so we're just trying to think what could possibly um, happen with these testimonies over the next 20 25 years um Pinkus, uh, have you been back to um Majdanek since we did the last goodbye? Uh I don't think so. No. How was so. it for you to how was it for you to be there for the last time um knowing that your you know the first time that you were there was when you left you know when your family were separated from you and, and by the end of that first day your mother father and Savina were already murdered and then your last visit a few years ago was to to sort of leave this legacy in this sort of technological methodology uh, what was it like for you to be there surrounded by all those cameras and green screens and paraphernalia did, what did that um it, did it get in the way of your feelings when you were there 
Well, I want to tell you that I had been back to Majdanek uh, like 17 times before, and each time it's difficult, but I am surrounded by, you know, my, but by the uh, 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 students and uh, adults and other people, and there's an empathy and there's a kind of, you know, you feel, you, 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 you feel safe and you don't, you tell your story and it's difficult. But when I was doing the virtual reality with you, you remember, I had to be on my own. You could ask me a question, but then everybody disappeared and nobody had to be around. And, and I was solitary and, and I was alone. And I will, I was, it was very difficult for me those three days when we were filming that virtual reality was extremely difficult for me because I felt almost as if I was there for the first time. You know, when I arrived there, uh, you know, when I went into the, the, uh, the, the near the guest chambers, into the room with the, with the showers, uh, which weren't full showers in my place. I mean, you know, I felt very scared. It was a different experience. So that experience was extremely difficult. I think that when you are alone, when you are with a group, there is a um, feeling of, of, of safety and, and, uh, and empathy and, uh, and, and, and you kind of have a, a kind of, uh, it's different. So that was extremely difficult for me. You know, especially that camera was a square one. We had two eyes on each one and it turned around, there was nobody there. And I felt really very fearful by standing there by myself and telling what was going on and kind of almost feeling that, you know, when I was telling the story about me and my father, you know, I almost, you know, my father was like standing next to me and I wasn't in the group. It was very, very fearful. Well, thank you for, for doing that, for your courage and telling your story, which you've done many, many times um, in different ways. And we want, really want to thank you uh, for that. Um, as we bring our, our session towards a close, um, I just want to, you know, in closing this, um, share with you that with uh, the Show Foundation, we're really thinking about um, how do we ensure, you know, six million Jewish people were murdered during the Holocaust. Most of them will never have a, many, will never have a name or maybe their names will be at Yad Vashem, but will never have a story that they can tell. Um, and those stories are really only told through the voices of the survivors. And so in a sense, the Show Foundation's archive is in a sense the, the story of every single Jewish person that was murdered during the Holocaust. And uh, when Pinchas and the other survivors um, have this courage to tell, we see this as the last act of resistance. You think about it, the Nazis in, wanted to ensure that the Jewish people were destroyed for all time, would have no name, no voice, no history, no language, no culture, and to eradicate that for all time. When Holocaust survivors share their testimonies, they're not only sharing their own life history with us, but they are reclaiming that past. They are making sure that that past is there for the future. And it, in a sense, what it's doing is saying, even though Hitler um, intended the eradication of the Jewish people for all time, and that this story would never be told, that this is the last act of resistance because they are telling the story to ensure that it is always known and that it is always preserved for future generations. Technology is just helping us to achieve that goal. A number of you on the call today um, talked about the fact there are many stories to be told around the world, and in fact there are, which is why the Shoah Foundation extended its mission to telling the story of genocide around the world and to give voice to victims and survivors from Rwanda and Armenia and Cambodia, and even up into the, to the present day. But also, we all need to take our own responsibility to make sure those stories are told. For example, in South Africa or in India and other places that were mentioned on the call. We can't do everything, but we hope that our technologies and our methods and our, our rigor will help others to tell the stories that they need to tell too. I think I'd love to uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Maybe you just sort of close out for us um, with some little reflection um, that will help us to sort of leave this, uh, this webinar today uh, reflecting on what the Holocaust means to you and when you think about what you went through, what's most meaningful to you? I think I'm going to finish off with a quote from the Baal Shem and that I always read it because I don't want to make a mistake. So I've got it in my diary and my diary, every year I transfer, transfer it to my diary from one diary to another 
and I don't, I don't remember. So I just want to, uh, uh, this is what I want to say. Uh, there are two things that, uh, that are very important. And that is the, the survival of that survived. And I can tell this, my grandparents and, and, and from both sides actually are alive because the memory is so important that it, and when you impart that memory to other people, then you bring them alive. So they they didn't they, they were murdered by the Nazis, but they are alive. They, they, he didn't wipe out their memory. And I want to share with you what the Balshemtov, and the Balshemtov goes back to 1760, as you know. Uh, he was the founder of the of Hasidism, and he, he 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 what he said is remembrance is the secret of redemption. Forgetting leads to exile, and and. And this is, to me, I always remember that, uh, uh, because the, to be able to import uh, the, the memories of, as you said, of those six million. When I speak, I don't speak for myself. I speak for all of them, all, all the, 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 the Heilig and Schumers, those, those uh, holy, holy, uh, um, those, those, those holy uh, people, that die, uh, that try to be wiped out from, from the memory. And so this is what it means to me. And I think when, when, when you, when you, when you memorialize, uh, it, it is, it, it, it is a, a holy task. It's a duty. Pinkus, thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please do keep in touch with what's happening at the Shoah Foundation. Follow along on our website. Um, and see what we're up to because um, we're continuing to tell this story. We have a program called the Last Chance Testimony Program where we're interviewing survivors every week uh, to ensure that their testimonies are here for all time. And thank you, Tally, and everybody um, at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center for all you do to amplify the story and to make sure that it's heard and it's known. It's a real privilege and a real honor to be with you all here today. And back to you, Tally. Uh, Pinchas, first with you, thank you so much uh, for always being there. You were there when we opened the building. You spoke at our opening. Uh, you are in our exhibition and uh, we are so uh, grateful for, for your voice and for your, uh, your commitment to, to better our world. Stephen, uh, what a joy to, to work with you. Uh, and uh, to, to, to have you inspiring us about uh, where we're going and how we can use new technology in such amazing ways. Uh, we will share the webinar with everyone. We will share some of the, um, some of the resources with everyone. People ask for, for a lot of the resources. Pinchas, people are asking for the Baal Shem Tov quote. So you will have to give us to write it in the chat in English, that people can get inspired and write, uh, you know, and, and, and quote you uh, with this quote. And just thank you for the USC Shah Foundation. Thank you for our staff, uh, to Catherine, Doey, Enchle, Jordan, everyone for, for doing that. And uh, tomorrow we are up again. It's Youth Day, it's 16th of June, and at three o'clock South African time, we are going to have a panel about memory and lessons. What can we learn from our own history and how can we connect it to the history of the Holocaust, the history of genocide? So we hope to see some of you joining us again to, tomorrow. And good night to everyone. It was lovely to see you all. Good night. Good night.